Welcome everybody to another installment of Wine Access Live uh, on the uh, Wine Access Group uh, experience. Uh, my name is Eduardo Dingler, uh, Vice President of Wine for Wine Access. Today is beyond an honor to have uh, an amazing person that needs no introduction unless you live under a rock and do not uh, learn about wine constantly. But uh, some of his accomplishments, uh, he was the owner of Madeleine Wine Shop in Paris. Um, he established La Carême de, de Vaughan, excuse my French, uh, in 73. But not only that, but his eye for recognizing quality throughout the world put California wines in the map when he uh, organized the Judgment of Paris in 1976. Um, so here, without further ado, Stephen Spurrier and also uh, amazing uh, co-host we have today, uh, newly minted Master of Wine, Vanessa Conlin, Head of Wine for Wine Access. So cheers to you guys. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, well, um, Eduardo, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. It's 6.30 here. It's aperitif time, but I see you've already got an aperitif, so that's good. Um, <laughs> it's so, never too late <laughs> or too early. Eduardo mentioned the judgment of Paris. I've just been writing something about it for... Um, actually, you mentioned also La Cadre de Vin, which is, I think, the thing, I'm, the, the, uh, wow. the thing in my life, in my wine life, I'm most proud of to have created a wine school. And um, that is, has found a new lease of life in uh, in what's called L'Académie du Vin Library. And uh, last year we became a publisher and we published our first book was Michael Broadbent's, the commemorative edition of Michael Broadbent's Wine Tasting. And had there been no Michael Broadbent's Wine Tasting, published in 1969, uh, there would have been no Academy du Vin and there would have been no Christie's Wine Course. Michael was the first person to show and write that wine tasting should and had to be structured. So that was our first book. And then we had Fiona Morris and 10 Great Wine Families, Sherry by Ben Harkins, uh, In Vino Veritas, which is a bit my baby, which is a compendium of the greatest wine writing from the past and from the present. And um, quite jokey, really. And also talks about art and culture. And this year, <clears throat> our first book out was Chateau Musa which has been a tremendous success. We did that with the Oshar family. And uh, in September, we're re republishing Hugh Johnson's The Story of Wine, which wow. is, um, I can't imagine why it's out of print, but it's been out of print for 20 years. And Hugh is not changing a word, but he's written <laughs> a six page forward saying why he's not changing a word. So anyway, we got lots of stuff on the board. So that's like how to my library. Stephen, there's no signs of slowing down for you. You are just going well, as strong is, as uh, you no, have. No, I'm, just, I'm just sitting here in Dorset. All I do is is think a bit. And, um, and then uh, for me, it's, uh, well, I mean, I'm 79 years old. I've been in the wine business for 55 years. Uh, <laughs> at this stage, to have a, a fascinating and creative and intellectual pursuit like like Academy of Divine Library, which is is I'm I'm a I'm a contributor, but I'm I'm also an observer and I'm part of the company. And then on our farm here to have Bride Valley, which is built for the long term for the next generation, I hope the one after that. So there there are two ventures which ten years ago I wouldn't even thought of, but they very much suit me in my sort of last stage of my life. So I'm still in wine, but I don't need to do too much work. Absolutely, uh, which begs the question, Stephen, what to create a, a sparkling project? I mean, something that's been recognized, but what, what really sparked that interest and in pursuing? Well, um, <coughs> when we, we were looking, um, we had a, when we moved back from, from Paris, we moved into a nice big house in London. And um, my wife said after about three or four years, that if, we, if she had a big house with a big garden, she'd rather have it in the country and not in London. And so we looked around and in fact, thanks to Michael and Daphne Broadbent, we found the house that we're in, in Dorset, where we've been for 33 years, but it only had about three or four acres of garden. Very nice garden, I must say. But my wife said, that's not big enough. I need room for my horses. 
And I said, I didn't realize you had horses. We don't have horses in London. <laughs> so no, but I'm going to get horses. So anyway, the people selling the house said, well, there's a farm just on the edge of the village coming up, 200 acre farm. Why don't you look at that? So we looked at it and <coughs> the price was right. And we, we managed to do a deal, put the, put the two together. And it had a huge amount of chalk on it. I could just see it was almost white with chalk. So I was still at La Carrière de in Paris in those days, 87. So I put a couple of blocks of chalk in my, in my pocket and put them on the desk in front of Michel Bertin, who was my top professor at yeah. L'Académie du Vin. You've all heard of Michel, of course. And I said, Michel... Raising a glass as well, it's Michael Brown. Where, where do you... Yeah, Michel, where do you think those are from? He said, well, Champagne, of course. I said, no, they're from South Dorset. He said, in that case, you should plant a vineyard. So that was 87. And then I had Michel Laroche from Chablis come over and spend the night with us. And he took a bucket of soil back to Chablis. And the analysis came back very good for Chardonnay or any cool climate grape like Pinot Noir. Well, that was 88. And we did nothing. We did nothing. Uh, well, I couldn't afford it. <coughs> and <coughs> had I planted, I would have planted Pinot Blanc. So I love Pinot Blanc and it probably wouldn't have worked. Anyway, so time passes, and in mid-90s, I'm invited to the awards ceremony for the International Wine and Spirit Challenge, handed a flute of something sparkling, and asked what I thought of it. I said, well, it's champagne, certainly Chardonnay, probably a Blonde de Blanc, why? Night Timber. Night Timber from Kent, Blonde de Blanc, 1989. And that had beaten all the top champagnes. And that set the whole English sparkling wine ball rolling. Night Timber is, is still the benchmark. They're up to about a million bottles of wine, and good luck to them. They're making fantastic wine. And then Ridgeview, <coughs> another very good uh, estate in Sussex, uh, they won the Decanter World Wine Award Sparkling Wine in 20, 2006, I think. And so that set me off. So I presented a dossier to the Boisset family in the uh, expert 2007, uh, Jean Charles, Jean Claude, was well, Jean Charles, you know, uh, Jean Charles was mad about the idea, absolutely super, and mad about the idea of doing something with me because we were both sort of entrepreneurs. And um, he sent out his sparkling wine guys, and what they wanted was to get about 30, 30 hectares, about 75 acres, and then we built a winery and so on and so forth, joint venture. But after all the analysis, there are really only 10 or 12 hectares top plantable. So Jean Charles said, our advice is you and Bella, my wife, you plant that yourselves. You get the vines from Pepinier Guillaume in Chassaigne in Burgundy, who supply the Romilly Conti and Domaine Le Fleuve and Roder and Bollinger. They are the absolute benchmark of all, of all vineyard suppliers. You take your grapes to Furley Estate, who's just next door, who's 20 minutes from us, who was English winemaker of the year 2012. And if all, go <coughs> if all goes well, we'll buy your wine. So off we went. Well, my intention of turning a loss-making sheep farm, which is what it was, into a profit-making vineyard is, I don't think, quite there yet. But I think we will get a little easier when the 2018s come on stream next year and um, it's, uh, well, as Philippine de Rossio said, making wines easy is the first 150 years that are a problem. <laughs> exactly. And for everybody that's joining, we're drinking and celebrating Bride Valley, well, uh, which great. is a, an incredible product that you're, you've been producing since then, since we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Stephen, I, I have a question for you. So, you know, Eduardo and I are joining you from the United States. We're actually both... Um, sitting here in uh, different places, but in Napa Valley. Um, and so yeah. my question is really about um, your advice for the American consumer, because I would say that Eduardo and I as, um, as wine professionals are, you know, have been excited about English sparkling wine and English wine for years. But speaking to many American consumers, they don't even know that there are wines produced in the UK. So I'm, I'm curious what your advice would be for us to tell your story to get more consumers excited? 
Well, in 1975, I didn't even know there were wines produced in California. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, not quite, not quite that. Um, I think <laughs> I think English sparkling wines are very good to be in a wine bar or a restaurant by the glass. I think that obviously if they're on a wine list and you buy it by the bottle, then you, you're going to be four or six or whatever. I think that at the stage of experimental wines, uh, I don't expect people to think of them in the same way as they think of maybe the, the, the good California sparklers or Champagne or Frank Cotta, which I really love, or even Carver, and certainly not Prosecco, which is another ball game entirely. But we are emerging and the quality, we're all, we're all cool climate, we're very cool climate. And I took, <coughs> I took my Blonde de Blanc 2014 to Chouy, which is a Grand Cru in Champagne, and a lot of us were there. It was a conference with the wonderful title, Fine Minds for Fine Wines. And um, I asked the owner of the Grand Cru Vineyard to taste it. And he said, Mr. Spurrier, you got what we've lost, acidity. And the Bride Valley has wonderful acidity. It's got great precision. Well, you're probably picking that up, Eduardo. It's got precision Absolutely. and purity. and it's watering. Yeah, and it's the acidity which doesn't get in the way. And I do a low dosage. That's got a dosage of eight. So I certainly don't want to smother the fruit. But we have this natural acidity, which will keep our wines fresh. And Bride Valley is an aperitif wine. Uh, we, make, we make a Blonde de Blanc. We make the Brut Reserve. We make a Cremant, in fact, which is our largest production because that's a little less sparkling. And we make a rosé, Bella Rosé, named after my wife. Now, <coughs> the rosé, you can drink with a fruit dessert. In fact, at the Gavroche in London, Michel Roux gave it for a big lunch given for me when I was to count a man of the year with a damson plum tart, because damsons are very high in acidity. But Beautiful. basically, Bride Valley wines are aperitif wines. Um, so that's that's about it. I think English wine <coughs> for the American consumer is an experimental, and there's some very good brands: Nightimber, Gusborn, Hattingley, Hambledon, Ridgeview, Whiston, uh, Coates and Seeley. They've all got a bit of money, and um, more than we have, but um, they they make very good wine. One thing we cannot afford to do in this country is make poor wine. The Champagne, the Champagne Noir can make poor wine because they've got the brand. We don't have the brand. So we can't get yeah. away with anything. Yeah. Would you, and, so, would you, but, um, but, oh, good. Hmm? Would you no, compare no, no, at all? Yeah. 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 Oh, Go I'm on. sorry. Would you compare at all what, what California was when you discovered it in the early 70s to what uh, uh, England's making with sparkling wine right now as creating that the force united in the, the uh, area? Um, no, I compare it to Oregon. Okay. If there's anything, if there's any country uh, that I would compare English vineyards to, it is certainly not California, it's Oregon, because Oregon in the late 60s had about 1,500 hectares or whatever. There was Erie, there was David Lett, and it, it's now got 40,000 hectares or so. And it's <laughs> it's kept its focus on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and it's very focused, and it's a farming country. Um, uh, we're nothing nothing to do with California, but I will say something. What's happening in the in England now is there's a lot of planting going on. There's some big planting coming from Tatanche that I entirely approve of, but there's a lot of money going into English vineyards without knowing where they're going to sell the wine. And that is, it's, it's, it's a risk because the new boys on the block, because they have money, will have to create a brand. We've got a brand, Bride Valley, it's got my name behind it. And the only way they're going to get in the market is by slashing prices. And undercutting. five years ago, five years ago, when what was called the UKVA, the United Kingdom Vineyard Association, <coughs> changed its name to Wine GB, which sounds like a football team. Um, uh, or rugby. We were, uh, 
We were at about 2,000 hectares of vines. We're now over 5,000. Three and a half million vines were planted last year. And it doesn't make sense to me. Five years ago, we were all friends. In three years' time, we'll be at each other's throats. And I intend to step right out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so it demands having an educational background to it. Go ahead. Mm, what's um, I had a question actually, um, sort of again about sort of consumer perception, but you know, we hear this phrase English fizz. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> do you think that referring to uh, to sparkling wine as fizz is has done a disservice to the actual quality of the wines that are being made? It's a total disservice. It's a total disservice. Um, I mean, one can say if you're at a friend's house, he or she might say, would you like a glass of fizz? And you know, you're not going to say, don't be so vulgar, uh, because you know exactly what, what is meant. And in fact, um, the phrase now, would, the question now, would you like a glass of champagne, is, <coughs> is almost showing off, because there's so many very good sparkling wines that champagne is much less served amongst my friends. Okay, so fizz is, Fizz is, is, it's blanket, it's, 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 um, it's in the public domain. Alka-Seltzer is fizz, for Christ's sake, so is Perry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, we're not, there's a, a, a lot of research, well, a small amount of research going on to find a brand name for English sparkling wine. And I'm incredibly against that because English sparkling wine says exactly what it is. It's English and it's sparkling and it's wine. So that's all we need to know. Yeah. Great. Yeah. But so I have one have... question, or sort of, a sort of question you asked was about the American consumer and, mm -hmm. um, and what they might look for. Well, obviously you were referring to English sparkling wines, but I think particularly and more and more, and I'm sure that Eduardo will agree with this, um, they have to look for, for wines of character, particularly in this lockdown, we're all reconsidering what our values are. For me, wine is summed up very simply by the three P's. It's the place, the people, and the combination of the place and the people produce the product. Therefore, wine has to have a sense of place and it has to have a sense of character. The character, of course, will come from the grape varieties planted on suitable soil and so on and so forth. You can't avoid terroir and you don't want to, and you can't avoid, well, you, you, winemaking should be as hands-off as possible in my view, but there has to be a person behind it. So basically, P1 plus P2 equals P3, you will inevitably, if the, those people's hearts and minds are in the right place, get a good glass of wine. Mm -hmm. So that's it, the three Ps. Makes sense. I, uh, I, so I have a question um, about uh, uh, sort of, again, asking your advice on something, which is you know, you're such a um, distinguished journalist and wine writer. So what would your advice be to a young aspiring wine writer today? Um, <laughs> well, there's a lot of blogs, magazines are having a problem, you have to find your voice. Um, I think the advice would be don't be discouraged, keep at it, keep learning, uh, make as many contacts as you can and write what you feel. Um, I, I mean, I, I like what in California, I like what Karen McNeil writes. Um, I, I very much admire my, my colleagues. I have, <coughs> apart from the books I wrote in the 1980s, I wrote five books in three years, uh, uh, which really did quite well because wine books sold in those days. Um, I would consider myself a communicator rather than a writer. Of course, I communicate through writing, but I'm interested in communicating with the people who are going to read what I say, telling them what I like and why I like it. So that was the basis of the Academy de Vin. I wasn't an educator. It was Michael's book who taught me to become an educator, but I was uh, giving, <coughs>
giving people my enthusiasm and my knowledge of wine, trying to pass that on. Okay, channeling, so what I've done, my own, what? Channeling, the, what you've yeah, learned. Yeah, channeling, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my wife has just brought me a glass of 2011 Grand Cru Riesling from Alsace. So there it is. I can. Oh, I fantastic. Can, Cheers ah, to you. Sure. That sounds lovely. <laughs> Cheers to that. He's a keeper. That's delicious. Good. Do you think that um, there are too many voices out there now in terms of, of writing? Do you think that it's a confusing for the consumer to figure out who to trust? Um, you were kind of cut off halfway through that. Um, I, 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 well, um, I get back to being a communicator. Uh, <coughs> My columns over the last 10, 10 or so years, particularly in the last three or four years of the counter, were recommended columns. Wines to lay down, wines to this, Spario's choice, so on and so forth. And I, I had a single page. Before that, for many years, I had two pages. And then I wrote about my travels. And also, I wrote comment pieces when I thought that something was going wrong, um, i.e. LBV, <coughs> late bottled port which was a disaster 30 years ago. Um, uh, I wrote a long article in Decanter about 20 years ago called Late Bottled Port, Port Back from the Dead. So, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to be opinionated, um, but those were in the days where I was asked to give my opinion. And in the last three or four years in Decanter, I'd just been asked to give my recommendations, which is, of course, my opinion on what people would like to drink. But um, I, I, uh, I, mean, I don't have a column anymore. I, I do a bit of blogging, but I mean, I, I do a bit of web work for the International Wine and Spirit Competition. And, but, you know, I've kind of stepped back in a way. Speaking about opinion and comment, uh, so obviously you've traveled extensively throughout the globe and you've, you've been in places yeah. like India and creating the Wine Society of India, connecting, uh, speaking of John Charles, which a, a producer, uh, obviously yeah. it's California, well known places. So what a place uh, excites you and what do you think it's, it's a new, the new place that hasn't been established as a wine region? Well, um, I was just in Uruguay. I was just in Uruguay over New Year's and I loved it where it's sort of established as a wine region. They've been growing wine there for about 50 years or maybe more. But it's a very small country. And in my view, it's the Europe of South America. So I think attention should be paid to European wines. Um, then, of course, the northern, the northern European, not, not I mean Scandinavian, but the European countries like Bulgaria and particularly Romania, that are making that are making very interesting wines, Slovenia, Croatia. I mean, <coughs> all these are indigenous grapes. They do have well, they don't really have the Chardonnays and the Merlots because they couldn't afford to import them, and so they really kept the indigenous grapes. And what I'm fasc <coughs> fascinated by now is the indigenous grapes, which has been around for a hundred or two hundred years in Europe, which had virtually disappeared and are now being replanted by people like Torres in Penedès and have never, Italy, Italy is the most extraordinary country for hanging on to or rediscovering the dying grape varieties. You read Ian Dagata's book on that. Um, I think that is more fascinating to me than another great Chardonnay or another great Cabernet or another great um, Shiraz. And I think I wouldn't say <coughs> I wouldn't say the home is in Europe, but I think Europe has the history, and it has so many advantages that 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 the offer from Europe is almost inexhaustible. Of the New World countries, uh, I think South Africa is the most interesting at the moment. Awesome. So um, what advice then would you give if, let's say, there's a, a new producer trying to establish them, themselves, what advice would you tell them to get their wines to market? 
Um, well, they they <coughs> they first of all have to decide which part of the market they want to be in. So basically, they have to set their own rules. They cannot allow the market to set the rules for them. Otherwise, they're in the market's hands, and that's not going to work. Um, then they have to know the right people. Um, they have to send samples or knock on doors or whatever. And if the wine is, if <coughs> if the wine is good, and it's not outrageously expensive, and it, 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 it represents a normal price, um, then they should find a market. They they should find people who want to buy it. There are lots and lots of <coughs> independent wine merchants in the UK or wine bars who can just buy 15 cases of this or 20 cases of that. So mm -hmm. I think, I think um, good wine will always find its place. Uh, and I think also I, I have, um, obviously, it's inevitable one talks about value for money. One can't, cannot talk about a product uh, really without considering value for money. But value for pleasure is much more important. And if you look at the pleasure X wines or Y wines might give you, um, they might give you more pleasure than you pay for them, or whatever. I, I don't know, but 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 I think the the <laughs> wine can only speak to you in the glass. But I mean, you know, so if you buy a Mondale or if you buy a Boisset or you buy a you 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 you, you buy a, a Loge, <laughs> something like that, you kind of know what to expect. If it comes up to your expectations, you're fine. You paid the money, you've drunk the bottle, fine. But if you reflect a bit and allow the wine to speak to you, to tell you its story, you will find probably value for pleasure because it's telling you something. And I think the American consumer and the British consumer and basically all consumers, they should listen to the wine more. Absolutely. I mean, speaking of that, we're... I've become very good friends with this wine that we, it's been in my glass and <laughs> over and over, and I, I really enjoy it. A project you started in uh, 2009, Bride Valley, and we love that you're sharing the stories and the, the wines, and they're finally carving an entry into the U.S. and uh, the American yeah. market, and people are getting excited about them, and we're, we're beyond happy at Wine Access to be able to tell the story and, and share it with the world uh, of wisdom, of, of what you've created with your... Well, do, do, I mean, tell, um, tell, I mean, I'd like to tell all your listeners who are hearing this that they must come and see us because the vineyard is simply beautiful. I don't know whether that's going to show up, uh, but that's uh, the vineyard. You, you can see the chalk. You may go a little higher. All right. Oh, oh yeah. Beautiful. Gorgeous. Some of us had the um, pleasure to see uh, images from uh, some movie. <laughs> Uh, some TV yeah. with Jason and the of team. Yeah. Yeah. That was an entryway yeah. for all of us, but that, that image is beautiful. Wow. And we've created a wine tasting room, but well, more important <coughs> for me, I've created a wine and art room, which is has my collection of pictures and artifacts I've collected over 40 years and where we can seat. In fact, we had the Boisset team for lunch last year. We can seat 24 people, but it is, you know, my colleagues in the English wine business, Gosborne and all these rich guys, they spent a fortune building their visitor center. This is just above the stable block. <laughs> it's cost us nothing. And we got a lovely stretch of water around the back where I've got freestanding sculptures. My other passion is, is art, by the way. And I spend yes, much more money on art than I do on wine. And um, I'm just completing, uh, which will be a new edition of my memoirs, which will come out obviously under l'academie du vin library label and the final chapter just three pages is wine and art comparing 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 wine's impression and art's impression on me i think they're complete well for me they're my two passions i can't that wait to fascinating <laughs> yeah absolutely but I, I, must, I must i must end off at the end of <coughs> At the end of October, we haven't really, well, we did mention the Justin of Paris. Um, Angela Dior of the Cultured Vine is giving a very, very big, well, Shannon, you would know that, uh, event, I think, on the 27th called 
judgment of Napa. So that's going to be, I'll be there for that. And I'll be a Clodova. Something to look forward to. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, Stephen, it's been so kind of you to take uh, to take part of your evening. I know you have a delicious uh, glass of uh, Grand Cru Riesling and, uh, to enjoy, so we won't um, take too much more of your time, but I had one final question for you, which yeah. is, I know you, you know so many people, your history in the wine business runs so deep, but is there anyone dead or alive that you have not met that you would really like to sit down and share a bottle of wine with? Gosh, um, gosh, gosh, gosh. Um, that's a very difficult question. Um, no pressure. No pressure. I, I, um, <coughs> I, well, I'll come back to, I'll come back to art. There's an artist who has the same name as I do, Stephen Spurrier. There's no relationship between us at all. And he died in 1961. But I have a big collection of his art. I've got about 30 or more of his art. And he was an illustrator. And when I saw his retrospective exhibition in 1961, and I was already buying art then because I'd learned a lot about it at school and my parents took me to art galleries. I thought his works were a little bit wishy-washy and too easy. And then 30 years passed and I started appreciating his stuff and buying it. And I got it quite wrong. He's an artist, but principally he's an illustrator. And he's an illustrator and he wants his works to give pleasure. And once, sorry, back on pleasure, once you realize that, and my collection of Stephen Spurrier's, I could take you around the house and show them to you. Um, once you realize that he was illustrated, he did a lot of work in the circus, in the theater. Uh, he was an illustrator. And, and, uh, and in a way that I'm a communicator. And I would love to sort of take him in, say, the mid-30s. Or, or maybe, well, take him at... Uh, well, my age now, so, so, so I mean, it, it's a, but I'd love to have, I'd, lo I'd love to meet him now over a glass of wine and tell him how much his illustrations, how much his, his pictures mean to me. <coughs> so that's, that's incredible. It, that's yeah. Wow. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. It, it is always quite a pleasure and, and just to share, for you to share your wisdom with us and everyone around yeah. us. And... Uh, big, big racing, a big glass for you. And thanks for, for this continued amazing well, efforts. Dan and Cheers. Eduardo and everyone who's seeing this, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Cheers. Thank you so Cheers much. Cheers to you. We'll talk soon. Cheers.